This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. This is is A Different different Perspective perspective with Kevin Kevin Randall. Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall Randall has been studying studying UFOs UFOs for nearly 50 years. years. Kevin Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good evening. We are back. And I would like to say before we started, winter has come. For those of you who are paying attention, I've had to shovel my driveway every Sunday for the last three weeks, and I'm getting annoyed with it already. Now, normally, if I was a real radio announcer, I would drop into my radio voice and say, tonight, on a very special, a different perspective. But uh, all these shows are are special. But the reason tonight's is kind of interesting is because it's our first international show, which means I'm sitting here in Iowa. Maybe I just should have said the United States. And my guest, Chris Bukowski, is sitting in Manitoba, Canada. So we're talking across borders, so to speak. For those of you who do not know Chris, he's a Canadian science writer and educator with degrees in both science and education. Since the mid-1970s, he's written about his investigations and research on UFOs, for which he is best known. However, he has been involved in many other writing and media projects for more than 30 years. 30 years, including TV, specials, planetarium, planetarium shows, planetariums, I don't know what those are, planetarium shows, and uh, newspaper columns. He has uh, published nine books on UFOs and related issues, a collection of short stories, and has contributed to many other volumes, both fiction and nonfiction. So some critics would say, well, Chris Bukowski writes fiction, so we can't believe what he says, which is something they say about me all the time. But I believe everything that Chris says because he's a good guy. His book, Unnatural History, was a comprehensive and historical survey of many kinds of paranormal phenomena, including ghosts, UFOs, Sasquatch, and lake monsters, and documented many of his own investigations in his recent works, which include A World of UFOs, I Saw It Too, The Big Book of UFOs. He is on Twitter and blogs at uh, www or http double slash ufoforum.blogspot.com. And uh, he does uh, book reviewing for the Winnipeg Free Pet, the Free Press. It appears often on TV and radio programs. He teaches courses on communications and is past president of the Manitoba Writers Guild and the Royal Astronomy or Astronomical Society of Canada, the Winnipeg Center. Uh, he has recently uh, was appointed the new moderator and administrator of UFO Updates, which was founded by the uh, late Earl Bruce Knapp. Now that I've just 
blown the first segment here with all that chatter. Welcome, Chris. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin. <laughs> That's quite a bio there for you. Well, I'm trying to catch up with you. You know, I'm, I'm a few hundred books behind, I think. Oh, uh, I'm I'm thinking 647, but you know that's just a round number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been investigating UFOs. And I think you you uh, sort of uh, confine your research, or you uh, emphasize research to Canadian UFO reports. Would that be correct? For the most part, yes. Yeah, I do. I, I study and I keep uh, try to keep abreast of what's happening elsewhere to to note the comparisons and to be able to uh, uh, note some uh, correlations of that type of thing. But for the most part, I, uh, I study and focus on the Canadian UFO scene. Well, I think I think all of us, no matter what country we happen to reside in, look beyond our borders. Although I know in the United States we tend to be a little bit American centric on that, and sometimes ignoring the important cases that happened in other countries and other continents and other planets, I don't know, whatever. So um, you've been uh, confi- I, I, compiling statistics that show, um, uh, I, I guess, correlation between UFO sightings and those that are not necessarily true or, or misidentifications and that sort of thing. Is that uh, meandering statement sort of correct? <laughs> well, since uh, the late 1980s, uh, I've been uh, putting up what's called the Canadian UFO Survey, in which I uh, collect as many uh, official UFO reports uh, that have been recorded from all across Canada and compiling them and trying to do some analysis. Because back then I was wondering, what does the UFO phenomenon really look like? How many people are seeing them? How many cases are in the east part of the country versus the west? Uh, do, do they resemble uh, each other in some way? Are there more reds than whites? And and that type of thing. So it's like an understanding uh, of what was actually being seen, because we see so many interesting stuff on TV and some sensational tabloid uh, information. I want to know what was really being seen by people. I mean, this is the the, fo- the foundation of the entire UFO phenomenon, is the, is the UFO report. And Chris, I want to Chris, look at the reports. Chris, I need to interrupt you because we're going to have to take a break. I told you this would be a short segment. Uh, you can find more about Chris at uh, UFO, uh, UFO Forum. Uh, it's uforum.blogspot.com. And we discuss these things at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And we will return in just a moment. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. And as promised, we are back. I'm talking with Chris Murkowski, who is a well-known UFO researcher in Canada and in the United States, for that matter. His uh, blog is UFO Forum. It's U-F-O-R-U-M blot dot blogspot dot com. So you can take a look at what he has to say there. And you can find his books in the bookstore, I suppose, um, and that sort of thing. We were kind of talking when we went away about the... Um, uh, statistics of UFOs, which I imagine a lot of people find extremely boring. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you're not talking about sightings, you're talking about numbers and who sees, uh, you know, how many people see this there and how many sees that there. And I know that a lot of people are more interested in um, not the statistics, but what they've actually seen. I mean, what are some of the best UFO cases that you've investigated? Some of the, the ones that you find the most exciting? Well, certainly some of the, the most interesting ones are the ones that involve uh, some structured craft that people have said to see, not just the lights in the sky, but things that people said that they observed that, that perhaps landed and took off and that type of thing. And there's some fascinating cases uh, in Canada over the years. And as a matter of fact, Kevin, I, I think I want to focus on next year. And the reason I want to do that is because 1967 was an interesting year for uh, UFOs, not only in Canada, but around the world. And uh, 2017 marks the 50th anniversary of some of the most interesting and classic UFO cases that some people may not be familiar with, and yet they are probably, in some cases, better than Roswell. And there's two that I can think of. There's actually th- and th- a third one I'd like to mention, too. But uh, there's one that happened, the Shag Harbor UFO crash that happened in October of 1967 uh, in, uh, just off the coast of Nova Scotia. Uh, there was one, a very fascinating case in uh, May of 1967, uh, the Falcon Lake case, which happened in Manitoba. And there was one that happened in Alberta, uh, Canada, in, uh, in August of 1967, which involved the uh, uh, investigation of possibly the first crop circles ever found in North America. And uh, these three, I think, are very significant. There are many, many other cases that happen in Canada. In fact, uh, a number of people have called it the year that, that uh, the world was invaded by UFOs in 1967. But these particular cases are really strange, and I think they deserve, uh, they deserve an additional look. And I was actually, even though one case happened in 1967, I was involved in the investigation when it was reopened a number of years later. Uh, but I'll start with, Shag Harbor, and uh, that some people may be familiar that uh, in October of 1967, uh, uh, a number of people had seen uh, a glowing object flying over the coastline and descend and crash into the water, into the ocean, uh, off the coast of Nova Scotia. Uh, RCMP were involved, uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force were involved. There actually had been a flotilla of vessels. This happened very early in the morning. Uh, the RCMP awoke and woke up some of the, the fishermen that were in this small village, and they all went out to see where this thing went down, and there's a, a green foam found on top of the water that persisted to, for some time. It was described as glowing, 
Uh, there seemed to be something just under the water. And from the shoreline before they got there, they said that they had seen something that looked like a dark object sitting on top of the water with some glowing material underneath it. This well, didn't, well some, didn't, some people, didn't some people see the thing in the air, and wasn't there a photograph taken? Um, there were a number of uh, people who had seen it. In fact, a lot of people had seen this, this glowing object moving through the air. There, there are, uh, have been a couple of photographs that have been said to have been taken of it, but uh, none of those have been authenticated. The ones that uh, had seen it, the uh, RCMP corporal and, and uh, a number of the other individuals, had simply said that they had seen this object moving through the air and descend to the sky, out of the sky into the water. Now, what's interesting is that uh, this case is documented. It's a UFO crash that is actually documented. There are official government records that say something actually crashed into the water, which makes it different than Roswell, uh, because uh, here we have a UFO seen in the sky and reported through official channels and falls into the sky, uh, out of the sky into the ocean. Now, there's stories that uh, uh, a number of people had seen uh, Navy frogmen uh, dragging something out of the water a number of days later. We do know that the United States uh, Navy had a base that was doing some operations not far away from there. Uh, so there does seem to be a connection. And even though you know we talked about this being uh, Canadian-focused, the United States plays a very important role in uh, actions on both sides of the border. So the Americans were involved. Um, and it's interesting that there was a recommendation by the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, that somebody go in uh, with the uh, Navy and find whatever it was that was underneath the water. Unfortunately, there's no official record of anything being found, and eventually people forgot about the case and it was dropped. However, in public memory, the, um, uh, the stories of this, this incident kept on going. As a matter of fact, there is a Shag Harbor UFO Festival just like the Roswell UFO Festival every year, and this year marks the 50th anniversary, and there's actually going to be a celebration and a UFO conference in Nova Scotia to mark that. So, fascinating case, and uh, it's been popularized over the years a number of times. Well, weren't uh, Don Ledger and Chris Stiles, two Canadians, uh, sort of responsible for bringing the case back to the forefront? Didn't they do an awful lot of the research? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, Don... Uh, uh, wrote his book, Dark Object, which uh, was a fascinating study. He managed to interview many of the, uh, the original witnesses, including some of the, uh, the Air Force and RCMP personnel. So it was very interesting, and we do have the documentation. They were able to obtain some of the documentation. So we have these official files that talk about what really is going on, and through the persistence of Chris Stiles and Don Ledger, uh, the, uh, the conference has been going on for a number of years now, every year, but this 50th year in 2017 is going to be something very special indeed. Well, when you say they're, they're documents, what do the documents say? Do they say there's a, a UFO? Do they say it's, do they, they uh, I guess, present some kind of a, a nonsensical explanation for what happened? Like we get here in the United States, we have a nice UFO sighting, and pretty soon we've got a bunch of really dumb explanations for it. And I just wonder if, you know, do these documents say it's a UFO? Do they attribute it to aliens? Do they do any of that sort of thing? Uh, is that they actually call it a UFO, unidentified flying object, and there is no explanation offered. It simply states the fact that this is what was reported, uh, these the sequence of events, who see, saw it, and and so forth. No explanation was ever put forth, and it remains open to this day. So that's another interesting factor why we think it's more important than Roswell in some ways, because we have no official explanation, no no dummies dropped from airplanes, no. Uh, uh, you know, no balloons or anything like that. There is no explanation. I mean, the facts are that something was seen to fall into the ocean. And well, to, to be fair, to be fair, the explanation where the dummies were dropped from balloons, well, they yes, were dropped yes. from airplanes. But, yes, that's true. But that, that's another argument. Uh, well, the question, the question I have, that, so the thing fell into the water. There's the green foam floating on the surface that, that persists for a while. Uh, what happened to the object? Do they have any clues where it went? What happened to it? No, in fact, uh, there, the story was that uh, uh, divers did go down into the water to try and search for it, but nothing was ever found. Now, whether that's true or not is anyone's guess, but the, the official explanation is that nothing was ever found at the bottom of the ocean. So, uh, I guess the, I kind of was searching for, I'm getting lost in my own syntax here. Uh, what, I would, what I was kind of hitting at is I, I had heard at one point that the object was joined by a second and both of them sort of uh, 
continued on their way uh, as, as if it was some sort of a rescue operation, continued on their way underwater and then I guess would have disappeared back into the sky. Any, any truth of that uh, rumor? Uh, nothing that I recall. No, I know that uh, there were a, a number of attempts to uh, to talk to some of the individuals involved in the rescue operations and the investigations. Uh, there are great stories that that abound. I, I did talk with one person who said uh, that she had seen something loaded onto a flatbed truck um, next to the ocean uh, in a different bay, uh, some miles away. Uh, and she swore that this was an official secret operation that something clandestine had been taken out of the water and carted away by the United States Navy. Now, whether that's true or not is anyone's guess, but there's an incredible series of, of stories surrounding this. It's just we simply don't know. The, all we do know, and these are some of the most significant details, is that uh, people did see this moving through the sky. The RCMP officers did see it moving through the sky, uh, and a number of people had seen it fall into the ocean, and a rescue effort was uh, tried by uh, getting a number of boats out and trying to, to see what was left on the ocean and poke around underneath the water, and nothing was ever found. Well, to uh, to bring this back into perspective, this, you know, as you mentioned, happened in 1967. At the time, the Condon Committee was in, in session, and the Condon Committee, of course, was the University of Colorado study commissioned by the Air Force to look into to UFOs. And my understanding in reading the, the case file from, from that point of view, the Condon Committee made a phone call to Canada, their, their total investigation, and yeah. learned that four teenagers had made the initial report or something like that and decided it wasn't. Uh, necessary for them to continue the investigation, so they just kind of ignored the whole Shag Harbor thing. And I'm thinking, maybe maybe it's because it was in Canada as opposed to the United States. But I'm th I'm thinking that that if I'm to investigate UFOs and we've got something like that going on, that's one of the first places I'm going to want to go is to Shag Harbor and talk <laughs> to the people within days of of this thing happening. But apparently that didn't happen. The investigation was conducted by I guess the uh, Canadian authorities then. Uh, with the assistance of the United States, is is that correct? Uh, yeah, it, I, I'm not sure exactly how much the United States was involved, because we, we do know that, uh, as you mentioned, the Condon Committee wasn't all that thrilled with it. Uh, but we do know that because the, both sides of the border were working very closely together on a number of UFO issues, that uh, there would have been some cooperation and there would have been some assistance on either side. But we don't have those documents. What we do have is the first series of documents that's that say that something definitely happened and that an investigation was recommended and that's where it stopped. Well, you know, that's kind of what we can say about Roswell. Something fell, but we don't know what it was. And, and unlike you guys, we don't have any documentation from the, the military side other than the FBI uh, telex that said you know, something was found, but it may have been a balloon, but we're not sure, that kind of thing. Absolutely. So your document... Your documentation is much more, uh, I guess, persuasive for a, a, a real strange event happening as opposed to the documentation we have for Roswell. Yes, absolutely. And of course, as I mentioned, there's a few other interesting cases that happened earlier in 1967 that uh, add to the mystery a little bit more. Well, I want to just, before we do that, let me, because we're getting short on time here on this segment, let me just ask this one question. Uh, you, the lady talked about the ever-present flatbed truck. Does, is, is there any... Uh, follow up on that. Is there anything to suggest that an object was removed and taken away on a flatbed truck, or is that? Yeah, unfortunately, because it's so long ago, uh, it, that lead could not be followed up on. That was something that came to light uh, a number of years later, and uh, we simply are left with uh, just a series of questions: What really happened at Shag Harbor in 1967? Did was there any corroborating witnesses for that, or was this a single witness report of the of the flatbed truck? No, this was a single witness report, unfortunately. So. We just are, are left wondering what exactly went on. But uh, according to her, it was at the time of the Shag Harbor incident, it was uh, a couple of bays over or, or, or something like that? It was, yes, it was. Uh, it's, uh, Shag Harbor is not too far from the city of Halifax, and uh, that area has a number of uh, uh, bays and, and uh, rocky areas where things could, you know, could enter uh, from the ocean and be hidden from view. So it was in one of those other bays where... Uh, this was uh, said to occur. And we do know, for example, that the United States Navy did have some operations at a bay not too far away from there. So it could have had something to do with that, or it could have had something to do with something completely different. Okay, we're going to take a short break here and get back to uh, Chris Rutowski on uh, this 
uh, topic, I, I, I'm thinking ahead, you know, we, the Falcon uh, Lake case and that sort of thing, two other good, very good, interesting cases in, in Canada in 1967. You can take a look at his blog at uforum.blogspot.com, and I often put up uh, other comments about uh, the things we talk about here at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and it's never too late to say, take a look at Roswell in the 21st century for a cold case look. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com.
And we are back once again with uh, my friend, Chris Rakowski, who is a Canadian UFO researcher, as you probably all know by now. Uh, his uh, blog is uforum.blogspot.com, and he appears in newspaper on columns, and he teaches classes on communications, and he's written some nine books on UFOs and the paranormal. Uh, some of which are the big book of UFOs, a world of UFOs, and I saw it too. So take a look at those if you get a chance. When we left, we were talking about Shag Harbor, and I think we pretty well mined that uh, topic. So I thought we'd move on to Falcon Lake, which I think is a CE3 case. And for those of you who are wondering, that means that the uh, object was very close to the ground and the Entities from inside it were seen by the witness. I, if I'm thinking of the same case that Chris was going to talk about, uh, which was in 1967, and he's looking at these as, you know, we're at the 50th anniversary of some of these uh, very important Canadian cases, and we thought we'd discuss those. So I'm going to throw it back to Chris and uh, let him talk about Falcon Lake. Chris. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> and it's actually a C2, not a 3. Uh, the entities were actually never seen. They were inferred. However, uh, there's some interesting aspects to this that, that really should be uh, talked about, because it was May long weekend uh, in uh, 1967 when uh, a fellow who was an amateur prospector, uh, he came to uh, this area just north of the uh, U.S. border, about an uh, hour's drive or so north of the U.S. border, and he was doing some, having some lunch around noon, and his attention was attracted by a number of geese that had uh, flown up from a little pond below him. He was on sort of a rocky uh, crag, and he looked down and uh, couldn't see anything. Then he was attracted to something in the air, and what uh, can only be described as a classic Hollywood-style flying saucer appeared to land on a flat rock not too far away from him, uh, within about 150 yards or so. And it was uh, saucer-shaped uh, with a dome. There were lights coming out of, the, uh, uh, out of some uh, areas at the top. And he watched this for some time. He was crouching down behind a rock and some bushes and was very frustrated because he didn't understand what this was. He what had been in the military. He knew that no such device could exist. But he figured maybe it's an American... Uh, a vertical takeoff and landing device. I mean, this was just a little bit before Apollo, so maybe it was a lunar something or other in his mind. And as he watched it over the course of the next half hour, um, this thing uh, was uh, stationary, but all of a sudden a, a doorway opened in the side and some lights came out uh, shining from that, and he could hear some high-pitched voices. Now he was definitely convinced that this was some sort of American uh, craft. So he stood up and walked towards it, and he shouted out, Okay, Yankee boys, come on out. I'll give you a hand fixing your broken-down flying machine, thinking that it had landed for repairs or something. And the voices stopped, and he thought, Oh, well, maybe it's not American. And he happened to be from Eastern Europe, so he spoke uh, in Russian the same greeting. No response. Spoke German. Uh, spoke a few other languages. He was multilingual. Still nothing. By this time, as he was walking towards it, he was right up against it. Uh, touched the side of this thing with his gloved hand, poked his head in, saw a series of lights that we would describe now as being on a computer. Uh, his hand got hot. He poked his, uh, his head back out of this opening and noticed that his glove had actually melted because the side of this thing was glowing red hot. Suddenly, this door shut in front of him. Very abruptly, the entire thing rotated so there was some sort of exhaust vent in front of him. And in a blast of hot gas, hit him in the chest, set his clothes on fire, set fire to the uh, pine needles and leaves that were in the area. The thing took off and zipped away. And uh, this is what I would call that a very close encounter, by the way. Um, he uh, uh, put out his, took off his uh, shirt and uh, stomped it out and stomped out some of the smoldering pine needles. There's a long series of uh, 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 time where he eventually got back to uh, a city, uh, to Winnipeg, where he was examined by doctors, treated for second and third degree burns. Initially said he was burned by an aircraft, but then he thought, you know, nobody, the, the question started saying, well, how did an aircraft get there? And he said, well, what really happened was, and he started telling a story about this flying saucer. Uh, the case was actually investigated by uh, the Canadian Air, Canadian Air Force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and even the U.S. Air Force. The Condon Committee had sent a number of individuals up to uh, uh, to study the case as well. 
And it's interesting that in the Condon report itself, the case is listed uh, in the index as unexplained, unidentified, even though in the body of the case, um, the, uh, the Condon report committee itself said that the case was probably a hoax, nothing to really worry about. And yet, we have a fellow who was physically burned by something. The site was eventually found. Um, the burn area was found. Radiation samples were, were found, or sorry, samples were found to be radioactive. In fact, the area was considered so radioactive that the Canadian government had thought about closing the area off to the public. Uh, and uh, the, there, we have 250 or more official documents from the Canadian government, the American government, uh, and we actually have the, the Condon Report's uh, uh, original files as well about this case. And I have to tell you, this is a very, very unusual case. It has all the elements that you'd want in a UFO case, physical evidence, physiological evidence, a witness who at no time did he ever talk about little green men. In fact, he was convinced he was burned by something that was an American secret weapon. Uh, and we have the documentation. So this is a pretty darn good UFO case. And uh, I can't think of anybody who agrees with the Condon Report's uh, evaluation. Well, uh, you say he was burned by the craft. Were there photographs of the burns? Or Photographs we... of the burns. We have also we have the uh, medical reports from the uh, medical uh, uh, personnel who examined him at the hospital and from his own doctor. He also went down to the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, uh, for a complete uh, physical and psychological uh, examination um, uh, under his own you know, ticket. He, he paid for it himself. We have the documentation and the report from the doctors at the Mayo Clinic and also the psychiatrist from the Mayo Clinic who concluded after his examination that uh, this fellow uh, isn't the type of person to make up stories and is a pretty solid citizen. So you throw all this stuff together, and it's a very interesting case indeed. Well, my uh, question is, I understand there were a number of fire towers in the area that were manned at the time, and they didn't report seeing the object or anything like that. Isn't that correct? There was one uh, fire tower uh, not that far away, um, and uh, I know that the uh, the person who, was manned the, who had manned the tower that they said that he had not seen any smoldering evidence of any kind. Now, having said that, uh, we were at the fire tower, uh, and... Uh, it is in a direction uh, that uh, is not the best angle to be observed from that fire tower. And, that, and nevertheless, you'd think that somebody would see uh, this smoldering, and uh, especially if the leaves and so forth were burning for a while. So it is puzzling why the person in the fire tower never saw it. Um, on the other hand, we do have evidence. We have the RCMP officer who encountered uh, this fellow when he came out of the bush seeking medical attention, and we have the testimony from him who definitely said, yes, he did appear to have been burned by something. So, um, you know, we have a lot of conflicting evidence, but at the same time, there's no question that something definitely happened. Well, the, uh, I, I understand they had trouble finding the location uh, when he re returned uh, sometime later. He couldn't find the place, and they kind of wandered around in the woods for a while. Uh, there was some trouble with that, wasn't there? Right. When they first went out there, um, uh, the, the fellow whose name was um, uh, Stefan Mihalik um, was a bit disoriented um, because when he was out there in May, the, the uh, trees didn't have leaves on them. When they went out there with him, uh, the trees had already sprouted. This was uh, many weeks later. And he was having trouble finding location. And I can tell you that, that I've been out there uh, several times, uh, even with guides, and it's a very rugged country. This is part of the Canadian Shield. It's uh, very heavily treed. Uh, there's a lot of rocks and uh, uh, cliffs that, that overlook various things. It's very disorienting, and uh, they couldn't find the site when they had gone originally, but it was found uh, not that long after the, uh, the Condent Committee had left by a number of people who insisted on trying to find it, and it turned out they were perhaps a, a mile or maybe even less than at a half of a mile away from where this thing really happened. So they were in the right area, and there's no question that it does conform with exactly uh, the way he described it, a, a small uh, uh, outcropping where he was having his lunch and then the flat area. 
where he was uh, seeing this thing. So it, everything does, does conform. It just they happen to be in the wrong area. And so we do wonder how come uh, the Air Force uh, and the Condon Committee who were with them couldn't find what they were looking for. In fact, Life magazine had sent a photographer and was out there with them trying to do a feature story and were frustrated by the fact that they couldn't find the site either. So it is a little puzzling, no question. Weren't some of the Air Force officers involved in the investigation? When I say Air Force, I'm thinking Canadian as opposed to American. Mm-hmm. But weren't weren't some of the uh, Air Force officers convinced this was a hoax as well? Weren't, wasn't there some kind of conflict there? Yes. In fact, the uh, um, one of the investigating officers um, actually took uh, Mr. Mihalik uh, to the bar, met him at the bar, and proceeded to get him drunk to see if he could loosen up his lips. Now, I don't know whether that's standard investigative procedures, uh, but uh, uh, they were convinced that uh, something definitely was amiss. And they spoke to the uh, cleaning staff at the motel where he had stayed. They spoke to the bartender, and uh, the bartender himself actually was very puzzling because he gave a completely different testimony uh, to what Mr. Mihalik had, had said, and it was later found that he had lied. So... Um, By lied, you mean the bartender has lied? As opposed the bartender to the lied, yeah. The, his, he gave com- completely wrong testimony about what had occurred. Uh, and the house cl- cleaner um, had talked about, uh, and was interviewed and said, no, that there was never any bottles of beer or, or, or anything that uh, were found in his room, whereas the bartender had insisted that uh, there had been a large quantity of beer consumed. So, you know, there's a number of interesting things here. The bottom line is uh, that... Uh, uh, this fellow never changed his story. It, it stayed the same throughout uh, all the years. In fact, he passed away only about 15 years ago. His family verified that uh, uh, that he was, you know, it was a staunch citizen and that they, he was very trustworthy. And we have the physical evidence and the physiological evidence. We have the medical records. We have the psychiatric records. Uh, the burns were on his body. They were visible. This clearly something had occurred to him. And and yet we don't really have a, a good idea of what really transpired. Well, when you say physical evidence, landing traces, was there something other than the radiation found at the landing site that would suggest something heavy had landed there? No, because it was this was a, a chunk of uh, granite that this thing had landed on, so nothing impressed. But the, the traces included the burned vegetation, which uh, w- were definitely tested by uh, a number of individuals. In fact. The, uh, the same uh, nuclear laboratory that tested the uh, pieces of material from Cosmos 954, which crashed into uh, Canada's northwestern uh, uh, Northwest Territories uh, in the 1970s, uh, took the uh, samples and tested them as well. So uh, we have accurate determination of the radiation that was found at the site. Uh, and it's very puzzling. Why would something like this occur and why would somebody, if it is a hoax, go to such lengths uh, to protract this? I mean, this person was physically burned, as well as radiation, and we have all these other individuals that were involved. So it's very puzzling indeed. Well, we're going to have to take a quick break here. Once again, it, uh, Chris can be found at UFO. RUM.blogspot.com, and you can find more discussions about UFOs at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and we will be back after a short break, so stick around. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, 
Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And as promised, we are back. Uh, Chris, when we went away, we were just wrapping up on the, uh, this uh, Falcon Lake case, and uh, I asked you during the break if there was something else going on, and you mentioned that there was a book coming out about this in the next year or so? Yes, uh, back in uh, uh, the year following this case, uh, a book was published about it, which has been long out of print, and uh, the family has been working with me to put out a, a new edition of the book with uh, information that's transpired since then, so that'll be coming out at a special public forum in 19, uh, sorry, for in 2017 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of this event, which happened in 1967. And you had one other case that you wanted to chat about uh, that happened in 1967 as well, so we better get into that while we have a chance. That's right. Um, and uh, it also happened in 67, as we mentioned, it happened in August. And what's interesting is that the same investigators who were involved in this 
uh, back in 1967 with the Falcon Lake case. Some of them were involved in this one. And it was the first crop circle found in North America. And I, I, I say that because it was, you know, very similar to things that were found in England and across North America since then. It happened in August in Camrose or near Camrose, Alberta, where uh, large rings uh, were found depressed into uh, a field. Now, this was actually investigated by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the uh, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. And in fact, there was a ministerial inquiry. Uh, the Canadian Minister of National Defence actually commissioned an investigation into these unusual rings that were found. There was no UFO associated with it, but because for some reason uh, somebody believed what else would cause this thing other than something dropping from the sky, and because the Falcon Lakes case had occurred just a short time earlier, uh, it was assumed that a UFO was involved. So, believe it or not, the first crop circle case in North America was actually investigated by the military. And the records are actually available. And some of the individuals investigating were some of the ones who actually investigated the Falcon Lake case. To me, that's a very significant development. What did they determine about the crop circle? They determined that these were not caused by... Um, vehicles uh, driving around in circles or anything like these are actually quite large as a matter of fact uh, i believe that uh, the largest one was about 80 feet in diameter uh, and uh, the, they, they did some tests they could not find any uh, burns they actually did radioactive tests to find out if there was uh, some radioactive material again because of the falcon lake case which had occurred not uh, that much earlier uh, things were not found to be radioactive they checked with plant scientists, they checked with farmers, they couldn't come up with an explanation as to what caused these rings that were found in this particular field. And again, I have to emphasize to me what's the most curious thing is that there was a ministerial inquiry called about this, and the report itself is now available to the National Archives of Canada. Uh, it's very puzzling indeed, and what's possibly more curious is that the minister involved at the time was none other than Paul Hellier, who has achieved some fame recently um, because uh, of his comments about uh, tall white aliens and, and, and uh, creatures coming to Earth and visiting because he's of the opinion that we are in fact being visited. But back in 1967, he was actually in charge of investigations of UFOs, and although uh, he doesn't really talk much about his previous interests. Well, when you talk about circles, I mean, are they just circles, not these elaborate uh, displays that we've seen in, from England, for example, is just circles, and it was at uh, 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 the whole thing, uh, I mean, a big circle or, or just sort of a rim type thing? Yeah, it was, I would describe it as a, the rim of a bowl, not the, not the inside part, just these, uh, an impressed circle, uh, not a, I don't know, a, a, not a pie plate, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> were there many, uh, many of them? Was it, there were two. You, Two. There were two, and they were quite anomaly. And you have to understand, this was 1967. This is long before anything was first uh, discovered in uh, in England first, and then progressed into North America, as most people believe. And for me, it does say that something very unusual was occurring in Canada in 1967 because we have uh, Falcon Lake, then these unusual rings, and then Shag Harbor, all in the same year, all within a matter of a number of months. So, 67, very interesting case, and I have to say, even though we've been talking about old cases 50 years ago, um, you know, Canada has kept up its share of uh, reports over the years. In fact, I'm just in the process, just before we uh, started recording this, I'm working on the uh, 2016 Canadian UFO survey, and there's about 1,000 UFO reports in Canada that were recorded last year, and going through them all is quite a chore, let me tell you. Well, if Okay, you're looking at those. How many turned out to be mundane objects, misidentifications? Um, unfortunately, the ratio is pretty small um, in terms of most of them uh, are cases I can find some pretty simple explanations for. There's some that I simply don't have enough information. I would say out of the 1,000, and we don't actually put out the report until about March or April in, in uh, 2017, but uh, just from what I've been seeing so far and about halfway through, I would say uh, maybe there's a handful or two that uh, make me make me scratch my head and, and uh, make me wonder what's going on. Well, something that we've talked about before on the program, not you and I, but others, 
is the fact that the cases aren't quite as exciting or as robust as they were 50 years ago. Uh, you know, things falling out of the sky and crashing into Shag Harbor and that sort of thing. Uh, are you seeing the same thing? Are the cases pretty pretty mundane? Uh, meaning, you know, maybe they're alien, maybe they're not, but you don't have any uh, spectacular sightings of occupants or landings or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I think with the, what's interesting is that uh, the really bizarre cases like happened 50 years ago have really fallen off the radar, uh, you know, pardon some puns and whatever. But um, the, the trace cases are almost vanished. Um, uh, Ted Phillips, uh, you know, con- con- compiled a great collection of UFO trace cases, but very few of those are, uh, uh, are around anymore. So um, I'm not sure what's going on, although uh, there still are some cases which are puzzling, but we just don't have the substance that happened in the heyday, let's say, from the 1960s. Photographs. How about photographs? Many photographs, as a matter of fact. Uh, I would say that uh, probably a quarter to a third of all the reports in the MUFON database are, have probably accompanying photographs. Uh, and uh, other, um, uh, other groups uh, that have files that we draw on for Canadian UFO Survey have many reports uh, and many photos as well. Uh, the trouble is, I, I think you need a license to uh, use a cell phone camera because uh, many of the reports we get are simple lens flares, uh, many turn out to be balloons, um, birds, and so forth. And people will say, I took the photo and I looked at it on, on a computer screen sometime later. And, it, you know, for me, it's mysterious, but uh, it's, it's something that's pretty, uh, pretty ordinary. So uh, I would say, unfortunately, the vast majority of uh, UFO photos that I'm looking at turn out to have pretty prosaic explanations. Well, I think we can we can say that about the the whole history of UFO photographs when we Absolutely. get right down to it. Uh, you know, the th- the thing that I wonder is, are you are you seeing a lot of hoaxes, photographic hoaxes, because of the technology available makes it much easier for uh, the you know the ten year old kid with a computer to make a pretty impressive UFO photograph. I would say that for the most part, no. Uh, I don't. Uh, the cases we're getting uh, with photographs are for the most part people who just simply don't know the optics of uh, cameras and cell phones. Uh, very few people are, are attempting to pull the wool over on our eyes uh, because we can come up with explanations for the vast majority of them. So I'd have to say the number of hoaxes are pretty small, but at the same time, we, you know, we do get reports now of drones and uh, kites with uh, LED lights on them and that type of thing. Whether they fall into the same category as hoaxes or not, uh, it's hard to say, although you know there are a couple of those that that do that are UFO shaped. So we're certainly getting some of those. But well, when you're talking about the drones, I think you know, if somebody's flying a drone and somebody takes a photograph, it, I don't think they're really trying to uh, create a hoax, unless they're working in collusion with one another. I think if it was just somebody's flying his drone and somebody else sees the lights on it and may just snap a photograph, not being aware of. Um, the drone being in the area. And that would seem to me be very difficult to identify unless you can see something on the photograph that gives it away. Absolutely. I mean, there are some characteristic, a number of people have uh, already done some photographic analyses of, of drones in flight uh, at night. So uh, it is easy to, to see some of the characteristics in some of the photos and videos that people are producing. But for the most part, I, I agree. I don't think people are deliberately hoaxing doing that right now. Uh, what we are finding is just simply many more misidentifications and people just uh, simply aren't familiar with the optics of, of cameras. Well, unfortunately, we're just running out of get, uh, time once again here. Uh, do you have a, a specific thing other than the book coming out in 2017 that you'd like to, to mention quickly? Uh, you've got your blog at uforum.blogspot.com, a website or anything like that? Well, I, uh, you, might, you did mention that uh, I'm currently the moderator of uh, the original UFO updates. Uh, you know, it's interesting to see that the reports are still coming in. Uh, the Canadian UFO survey will be out uh, in uh, early 2017. Um, and uh, the reality is we've been talking about some interesting cases and even the st- statistical data that shows a lot of cases have explanations. But, you know, there is that residual percentage that are a little bit puzzling and just a matter of trying to understand what the UFO phenomenon really represents. Well, Chris, I thank you for taking time to share this information with us. It's been enjoyable. And uh, you look like you're quite the qualified guy to be looking into UFO uh, sightings. So I thank you very much for joining us here on, on A Different Perspective. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay. For those of you uh, who are paying attention... 
Uh, you can find out more information about this. You can hear the program again if you so desire at uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Uh, my book, Roswell in the 21st Century, is out. I think it is a, uh, a closed case examination of Roswell without the sort of bias that is brought into a lot of the, top, the topic where either you're a, a true believer or a skeptic. I think I've, I've tried to walk that thin line to uh, uh, come up with the information that it best gives you an idea of what happened in Roswell in 19. Uh, 47. So take a look at that if you have a chance and look at uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com for other cases, UFO cases being reported. And we will return uh, with another episode of A Different Perspective in very short order. So thank you for tuning in.